All right, folks, welcome to Lessons from the Field, Tips for Using District Resources. I'm Tony Perez. I'm a high school LAIST here, Northside. Um, and today, our goal is to talk about some truths about teaching virtually and in-person simultaneously, um, discuss how teachers around the district are using district resources, and maybe discuss some ways to optimize in-person instruction using the district resources. So. I think one of the biggest problems that um, administrators and then people in my position have is that uh, we've never experienced teaching like this before, right? Um, before I could say I tried some things in my classroom and that they worked for me, uh, but now that we are in this virtual hybrid, um, half people in person, half on screen kind of model, the things that I know I try in the classroom that work, I don't know that they work anymore in this setting. So one of the things that I did in order to um, better understand your situation and your current reality was to uh, teach a few classes via Zoom. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to teach the in-person piece, but I did um, teach virtually for three days at Stevens High School, and it was an English one class. So I am by no means an expert. I am I am not the uh, uh, the soldier that you guys have been all year. Um, I've just dipped my toes in a little bit, but I did learn a lot from that experience. Um, the other thing that I've done is, is visit with teachers around the district and really try to discuss um, what it's like to be um, teaching in this, uh, in this current reality. So these are my takeaways from the field um, after teaching for a few days virtually. First thing is whatever, Newton law is in full effect, right? Like whatever can go wrong is gonna go wrong at some point with the with the virtual setting. Um, the Zoom might crash, the links may not work, et cetera. And you gotta really be ready to roll with the punches. Um, the next thing that I really hit me hard was that the 15 minutes aren't really 15 minutes. Once you get past the uh, attendance and like housekeeping stuff or giving kids reminders about um, what shirt to wear for the school spirit day or pictures are due or all the other things you got to remind the kids of. Don't forget to turn in the assignment last week. Um, and then you uh, have to give directions about what they're going to do that day. Cause to me, that's not instruction necessarily. You're not teaching them anything. You're just telling them what to do after you've taught, right. To show them that they learned what you taught them. So once you get past all that other stuff, you kind of have to talk through, you really only get about five or 10 minutes of actual instruction time. And then on top of that, not only is your normal instruction time maybe cut in half or, or a third, then you also, um, the lessons are taking three times as long in this environment, right? So that's kind of a crazy thing to work through. The other thing is you're really not teaching um, two groups of kids, even though it feels like it because you got the Zoom and virtual and then the in-person. You're really teaching three. You've got the kids in front of you every day or every other day. You got the kids zooming regularly, um, but then all still virtual. And then you got the kids who are completely asynchronous, right? Um, and that's a real challenge. And that's a thing that I had to wrap my head around uh, when I was teaching virtually. The other thing, a real big challenge is handling that in-person instruction after the 15 minutes is over. Once the Zoom is done, you have these kids uh, in your classroom and you still want to create some sort of equitable experience with them and the kids who are not in the classroom. And, that, and that's kind of a, another hard thing to wrap your head around, or it was for me. The other big takeaway is that... Um, what grade level you teach really matters. Obviously, that's always been the case. Teaching upper level has its challenges and rewards, and teaching lower level freshmen, sophomores has its challenges and rewards. But, and what I've seen is that freshmen are less likely to watch a video posted or turn on their cameras or mics or engage in a breakout room or even a discussion in the chats or by turning off their are turning on their microphones, right? So um, seniors, juniors um, are a little bit more ready to engage, and that's probably for a lot of reasons. Uh, maybe some of its maturity, maybe some of its technology functioning, maybe some of its uh, being new to high school and not really understanding, um, still feeling the way through that or getting some confidence or, or maybe not knowing people in the classes the way that you tend to when you're a junior or senior. Um, the other thing that's been really difficult is scaffolding um, virtually because uh, you want to, once kids log off, you don't have a chance really to talk to them again mm, uh, unless they check in with you, which is really unlikely, um, until the next day. And, um, you know, you got to send them off not only with enough teaching and directions, but maybe a thing or two, like a sentence starter, if they need it, right, optional, um, to get them over the hump once they leave your class. And, and they're confident that they know what to do, and then they get there and they don't necessarily. So how to scaffold once they leave is, is another challenge. And then obviously not doing that for every student. 
So this is my process teaching for, for three weeks with English or three days, sorry, for English one. I went to our resources uh, that were created by Emily Soboda and I looked at the text set. We're doing the multi-genre and I wanted to teach fiction, right? And so I went to the text set and for fiction, I saw that she's got two kinds here and then two excerpts from Aristotle and Dante, uh, Secrets of the Universe. And I love two kinds, great story, but it's a little long. And after seeing how little time I have with kids, uh, I felt like I couldn't do that short story or that excerpt from uh, the novel Joy Luck Club. Um, just in this environment, I, I, and I needed something a little bit shorter. But under no, normal circumstances, I probably would have used that one. So I took the third fiction option from Tech Set One. And the reason why I chose this one, it has a lot of dialogue in it. And when I did a preview of multi genre and asked kids, you know, what they noticed about the different genres, a couple of students said that the things that stood out to them about fiction was dialogue. That's how they knew it was um, a short story right away. And I thought, that's great. Let's review that real quick. And then I want to try to teach them just one couple new things about uh, dialogue and what it's doing in a story that they may not have already noticed. So that's why I picked this one because of the dialogue and because it was short and I thought it'd be engaging for kids. So in designing the lesson, you know, the multi-genre is, um, is meant to somewhat be, well, part of the reason we're doing this unit is to uh, review the text features of all the genres quickly um, so that we can kind of do deeper dives later. And so I quickly gave these reminders to the students. It took me about 30 seconds to a minute to go through these um, in slides in a Zoom. Here are the big elements of, of uh, fiction. And I probably should have put point of view and theme as well, but I thought this would get us started. Um, and then in characters, right, like these are the kind of the big things we talk about with characters, dialogue, actions, thoughts, maybe physical descriptions, and then also how they interact with characters. But these are the things we're looking for um, when we're studying and analyzing characters. But I really, like I said, I felt like in the five to 10 minutes of actual teach time, all I could really talk about was dialogue when I'm talking about character. I didn't even have time for any of these other things or any of these other elements of character. I felt like I could only really do a good job with character. Part of the thinking is I might have another day with a short story excerpt tomorrow. And the other thinking is in English one, I know that the next unit is character and theme. And anything that I don't hit in the elements of fiction in the multi-genre unit that I just didn't have time for pacing wise, I can hit there. So I wanted to get some of the some of this stuff out of the way now, some of the review, and then um, I can do a deep dive in that later. So that's also in the back of my mind. It's also in my back pocket. So these are the things I wanted kids to maybe learn about dialogue um, that they may not have learned in middle school. So why do writers include dialogue in uh, when they're developing characters? Um, dialogue usually gives us insights into the, who the character is, right? We learn a lot about them by what they say. Um, Usually dialogue when you're talking with somebody else, um, not usually, but sometimes it'll reveal a conflict with that person that they're talking to. A lot of conflicts kind of come out in there, at least the um, person to person ones, and maybe even sometimes the ones that are going on inside. Sometimes a character needs to talk that out with another character. Um, and you learn a lot about a character when they interact or talk with another character, because just like in real life, um, I'm gonna talk to my best friend or my mom or my dad or my wife or my children or my boss differently, right? Like every time I talk to somebody differently and I show a different aspect of my personality, um, I reveal something else about who I am. Okay. So that's another thing to keep in mind. You might think the character is one way all the time. And then you see them talk to this specific character and you're going to see some new uh, character traits for them or insights into who they are and some development of character, which is what we're after. Okay. So what I did was I took that excerpt and I put it in a doc and I, uh, I read it to the students uh, and I made some notes about the dialogue and then I color coded the dialogue. I did all this ahead of time. I didn't do this live, the color coding piece. And I talked through, I did some think alouds with them. So I said in this part of dialogue, I noticed that this about Dante's character. And in this part of the dialogue, I learned he has a certain kind of relationship with his mom. And in this kind, uh, I see that um, he's got also a conflict with his mom. And then this part of the dialogue is sort of both a conflict revelation with his mom and also some more insights into who he is with his mom uh, and, and about him, right? So all this modeling took about um, maybe five to eight minutes. 
And then uh, I put this in a doc for the students with my model at the top, and I gave them the rest of the excerpt for them to annotate for themselves. I wanted them to pick dialogue that they noticed, and then on the right column, tell me what that revealed about the character. Um, either it might have been in conflict, new things about the character, or something about their relationship with the character they are talking to. Um, and that was the assignment uh, that we did, and I felt like that's all I could do in about the, the 10 minutes of direct teach I had and, and, and the extra five minutes of instructions and attendance. Um, so yeah, so this was their assignment. And I would say that the top half, the part that I read to them aloud um, is about three to 400 words. And then they had about four or 500 words to kind of read on their own and, and work through. So it was a, you know, it was a really short excerpt, um, but I felt like um, there was going to be doing some high level analysis about character and dialogue so uh even though the excerpt is kind of short um i thought i could i got what i needed out of them with it and that's another thing we realized right the excerpts we have to be teaching um, need to be really short so here's a quick debrief about this um, the resources that we made um, are not just for this year um, even though I know the curriculum is brand new this year and the TEKS are brand new this year, it was also for the duration of the curriculum and the TEKS, which is going to be eight to 10 years. So I know that these things aren't playing out the way um, we thought they would and probably the way you thought they would um, in this current situation of teaching in a pandemic, but um, know that we understand that and we're in this for the long haul, not just this year. And because of that, um, we want you to think of the resources like an iTunes playlist, right? You want to be able to pick, choose, and tailor materials to fit your needs. So um, you don't have to go through every text set, right? Um, and you may certainly use just excerpts of the text that you see, and you want to use them um, thoughtfully as you're, as you're teaching your students, okay? Um, you're teaching micro lessons, not mini lessons, right? So, you know, what is that new information you want your kids to know? Um, how can you quickly get it to them in the time that you have so that they can be successful um, if they're completely asynchronous um, or after the Zoom, you know, they might have some challenges on their own. Those are some things to be thinking through. But, uh, you know, I really want you to to have permission to kind of use the resources um, to fit your needs. Uh, you know, certainly don't feel like you have to assign one of our model lesson hyperdocs uh, all in one day. You know, that would probably take three days. Um, to get through. And you may not even be using the warm up uh, at all, right? You may just be getting through the text and, and, the, and the content, the English content. All right, so to prepare for um, teaching in the classroom, one of the things I did is I looked at a couple of Schoology pages across the district. I was really fortunate to um, have some teachers uh, add me as administrator to the Schoology pages. And if you have a friend, uh, uh, at a different high school in the district, I strongly recommend you you add them or ask them to add you as their uh, to their school G page and vice versa because I I learned so much just by doing that and seeing other school G pages out there and seeing how teachers were chunking the resources and uh, and using them. Uh, one more thing, the the stuff that I just showed you, all this stuff is in section one of the hyperdoc. If you go there, and there's also um, my lesson plan for the week and how I adjusted it for the pacing calendar. Okay, so I took the district pacing calendar and I adjusted it a little bit um, and added some lesson plan notes for me on on how I taught those three days and how uh, I kind of set up the teacher I work with to to finish out the week. Okay, so uh, in section two of your um, hyperdoc is l sample lessons um, and assignments from around the district. I think there's 10 or 11 in there teacher examples of how teachers are using our district resources and then um, remixing them. I like to think of this as a collaboration. Uh, you know, teachers are teaching on the daily, right? And you're featuring CNI. Everyone, every once in a while, you bring us in to, to give you a verse or a chorus. Um, so they're using our resources, but obviously adding their own flair um, and trying to really make them work for their kids in their situation. So here's kind of what I learned and what I want you to learn after looking at those resources in section two of the participant page hyperdoc is um, you, the things that I saw really successful for teachers were that they added warm ups based on student interests or maybe their closing tasks. Um, they added notes for more content or context um, if they thought that their kids might need a little bit more information about certain figurative language or things going on in a time period or, or something about the writer or the story that they were reading, they added that. 
Um, I saw a lot of teachers scaffold the assignments for students as necessary, but they made, what I love the best about that is, is they helped those kids who needed it, especially once um, they were off the Zoom or completely asynchronous, but it was always optional for the student to do it. They, they, it wasn't a mandate, right? Because we never want to force a scaffold on a student that either A, may not work for them, right? That, that graphic organizer or outline process or et cetera may not work for them in their learning style. And B, they may not need it. They may be ready to do the assignment or the task without the scaffold, right? So we wanna make sure we're not forcing those own kids that they're there um, in case they need it, right? They're like a, a safety net in case they fall off the tightrope they can be learning. Um, I saw teachers give choice when possible. I think it's it's always great to give choice as much as possible, but it's really difficult maybe to do it every day um, with every task or every teak or teaks. But, um, you know, when possible, I saw teachers doing that. And I also saw a lot of teachers kind of adding some kind of engaging virtual foldables, uh, padlets, um, um, uh, Nearpod activities, things like that. Um, to go along with the district assessment question. So we gave you the question, right? We gave you the, the assessment question uh, to match the TEKS um, to make sure your kids are at the right level of rigor. But it's up to you guys to figure out what's the best way to get your kids to answer that in a way that they might find fun or engaging or unique because we know we got to switch things up for kids a lot. And so I saw that as well. So those those resources are there um, for you. And I hope you find it useful and inspirational to see what other teachers are doing across the district with our materials. All right. So those are the kind of our first two objectives. Um, the last objective is kind of what are we doing after the 15 minutes of Zoom time is over? Um, and what are we doing during the, the Zoom time? So um, I think the best things you can do is teacher model, direct teach, do a think aloud. Um, annotate with your kids, really show them um, your reading process and your writing process and make that explicit for kids. Modeling is one of the best ways, no matter what it is, whether you're teaching English, whether you're teaching karate, music instrument, whatever, of showing somebody how to do something and then having them do it themselves, right? And then giving them feedback. That is the basic process of learning anything. So to me, that's probably the best use of the um, of the 15 minutes, or maybe not the best use, but definitely one of the best ways to do it. Maybe you're doing that really successfully in a video and kids are watching the video and you can do something else, but always a good suggestion uh, for the video uh, posted or for your Zoom. Um, class collaboration, uh, mics on um, or in the chats. Um, I noticed from my experience that the freshmen were not very um, big in the chats. I didn't see any kids' faces, by the way. I didn't have a mic turned on. Did see one bunny rabbit, but that was it. Um, but I noticed if I asked a really low level question in the chat that I got some feedback. So if I said um, type one, if you are almost done with your draft, type two, if you are done, type zero, if you're like, what draft, right? I would get feedback like that, really low stakes. Or if I said for a warm up, what's your mood? Type one, two, three, four, happy, sad, confused, et cetera. Um, or if I just said, you know, the simple invitation, what words stand out to you? I did have kids typing that kind of thing in the chat. Um, so if you're asking them a more open-ended question or a question that might seem uh, a little bit more assessment-like, like that might be, um, if you kind of switch the question up, you might get some more um, feedback in the chats if you're doing that. Another tip I learned from a teacher is ask kids to chat you privately in the chats rather than publicly. And I saw some teacher get some really good answers from kids um, who were too afraid to chat it in uh, to the whole group, but weren't afraid to tell the teacher privately. Um, so that might be another way you can get some more um, action in the chats if you are, are having trouble with that. And then obviously small group work time. And I know this doesn't work for everybody. Um, some it's dependent on grade level and just, you know, the kids you got. Um, but obviously if that's working for you um, or you haven't tried it yet, that's another great use of the, of the Zoom time. Um, and here are just some ideas of what you might do after the 15 minutes are over with your in-person kids. Obviously individual student work time, you wanna give them a chance to get the assignment that everyone else just got finished um, in class. And then you want to obviously be working with that student if they have questions. So one of the things you can do is always provide immediate feedback um, virtually, right? Or, or, or via Schoology. Um, I'm not suggesting you get too close of a student, to a student, but that's something you could do after they do the work. Um, you could have virtual group I work with others in class. If there's two kids, maybe they work as partners in, in Schoology or four, then you can get some conversations going. 
modeling again, obviously something else you could do. Um, you could assign a different text or a different part of the text to practice with. Um, another thing you could do is just uh, kind of look for different things in the text. So maybe you were talking about dialogue, but um, the character is interesting and you guys want to have a discussion about other things that know about the character other than dialogue. So right, just extending the discussion like you would in a normal class period. Um, all of our hyperdocs have um, other questions that are not necessarily the assessment question and like videos for warm-ups and things like that. So you could always have them do the warm-up as a closure, as an extension, because most of the warm-ups are kind of like, how does this concept, English concept play out in a movie or in the real world or in a different forms of art, right? So maybe you don't have time for that in the Zoom, but that could be something you do um, for your kids in class, in person, so they can really kind of deepen their understanding of the concept and um, and kind of understand it on, on, a, on a more uh, global level. Um, you could also have them watch our videos of us doing the direct teach. If you did the direct teach live with your kids and you maybe they want to see another way to, to have it explained, maybe you can go to one of our videos. Um, you know, the other thing I said was like, uh, I was talking to a teacher about what else we could do. And she said, well, what would you do? And I said, you know, if we were talking about dialogue that day and my kids were done, I might say, hey, what movies do you, do you really like? And, and just like essentially have them help you pick a clip and then kind of throw up on the YouTube and say, okay, let's watch this clip from your movie. That's school appropriate, right? And see what the character says and what we learned about them just from the dialogue, right? So just kind of reinforce that in a way that's a little bit more engaging and fun. Um, so those are some other things you might want to do after the 15 minutes. Now, I know that there's two big problems uh, with that time after the Zoom ends and you still have your kids live, uh, or maybe three. One is um, the kids might be behind in, uh, do another work, right, that they have for you. So, you know, I understand wanting to give them time to do that and work through that and give them some really individualized instructional time on things they're missing. And I, and I have no problem with that. Uh, you know, the other big problem is that if you only have one or two kids in a class, it's really hard to get that class dynamic and that class energy and that class momentum going in a way that you can do all these other things uh, you know, back in the day when you had eighth period and half the kids are, are more left for f football or band, right? Like, and you only had five kids left. It really changes uh, what you can do with them and how long it takes to do it. So, so we understand that. I understand that. Um, and I know that can be really difficult. And the other thing we fully realize is that, um, you know, teaching in this environment, um, doing the attendance piece, answering the emails, uh, giving the feedback via Schoology, um, posting a video for later. All these things are, are extra um, things that pile up timing wise. And that's, you know, and it may be that the only way to, to keep your head afloat is to, uh, is to do some of these things while kids are, are working individually. And, and we understand that as well, but I think these are things to definitely work towards, um, aspire to try with your students and, and, and make a really concentrated effort to try these things. Um, because I think we're really trying to um, have students have kind of 45 minutes of learning um, every day as much as we can. And so these are just some things to be thinking about that you might want to try after the 15 minutes is over if you haven't already tried them and you're looking at ways to, to engage your students in learning um, who are in person. Okay, final debrief. So four big takeaways I want you to have. Uh, resources are like a playlist. Please pick and choose what's best for you and your students. Um, you know, while still covering the teaks, obviously. Um, the Zoom allows for only micro lessons, not even mini lessons. So be surgical about the content activity you want your kids to engage in. Um, what uh, equal opportunities must be given to virtual and in-person students. So if let's let's say let's go back to the example where I said I might pull up a, a movie clip that my student mentioned that they really like a character from. So we have a good discussion about dialogue in that clip. I would just load that in Schoology, make it optional for those kids, and just say, you know, what did you notice about the dialogue in here? And maybe it's extra credit for the kids who need it. Maybe it's 100% optional. And and that's okay. Maybe very few kids engage with it, but at least you gave them that same opportunity that the kid had in class. Okay? The other thing is to do more with less. So you got to permission yourselves not to treat this year like it's a normal year in terms of uh, how you're going to cover things and maybe even how much you're going to cover or what you're going to cover, right? So, you know, feel free to choose uh, shorter texts when when you can, when it's appropriate. Uh, you know, um, you might, like I said, in normal class periods, if I was doing um, an informational argumentative thing, we might read three or four argumentative essays, and now I only get to do one. 
um, to really be my anchor text or my model text, and that's okay. Um, you know, you're not going to get through all the text sets. That's okay. Um, just, you know, try to do more with less. And uh, I know a lot of people are behind the pacing calendar. Uh, that's okay. Um, you know, we want to stick to the pacing calendar as much as possible. Um, so we cover everything, right? All like all the content, all the units, right? But um, but we know that it's okay to be a little bit behind there. Um, if you are behind, what I would suggest is uh, really look at the year at a glance and think about, okay, when am I going to cover these things again? Because everything will come up again at some point. So what do I have to cover right now to have my kids be successful? And then what can be built upon for their knowledge for later, right? Like, so maybe... It, once again, short story, maybe all I can cover right now is characters um, in the multi-genre unit. And then when I get to character and theme and fiction in general, maybe I'll start talking about how setting and character comes together or point of view, uh, theme, all these other things that come up in uh, fiction as well. So that's the other thing I would really recommend is really just think about what do I actually really need to cover today or this week or in this unit? when I think about the big picture and what else is coming, because I know I'll have a chance to do more with these uh, genres um, as they come again. The curriculum is kind of built like that this year too, to kind of get a second, third or fourth shot to cover all these things in a new way or in a different way or in a deeper way. Um, so kind of keep that in mind as well. Obviously, if you have any questions about this, um, feel free to shoot me at Google Hangouts or email me at anthony.bettis, P-E-R-E-Z, at nisd.net, and I'll be happy to kind of chat through these things uh, with you again. And be sure to look at the HyperDoc. Section one is is my materials for teaching for three days, uh, and section two are uh, teachers around the district using our materials to teach um, throughout throughout the district throughout the year. All right, folks. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for viewing. Have a great rest of the year.